yourself and let us know what uh, what your campaign is about, and then we will uh, then we'll take some questions. I do want to say because I've gotten actually a bunch of questions emailed to me. Um, I will be prioritizing Grand Street Dems members when we go for questions. Um, if uh, 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 and if we've got time, I'm certainly happy to call on anybody else. I don't mean to exclude anybody, um, but I just want to make sure we get some opportunity here. Um, so when we get to that point, or even beforehand, if you want to click the raise hand feature or uh, make a note in the chat that you've got a question, and I'll be able to call on you then. Uh, so Maud, welcome. Hello. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, nice to see you again, and uh, nice to see everyone here. Uh, at Grand Street Democrats, and also um, hello to the familiar faces. Um, I see uh, names that I know and faces that I know, uh, and then hello to the people that I don't know. <laughs> so hello to everybody. Um, so first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about me. Um, I'm a public defender. I work for, um, I've been a criminal defense lawyer for my whole career working for the city's largest public defender agency. Uh, my husband, Juan Pablo, and I have four children. Our kids range from um, a newly minted high schooler, a 14-year-old, also have a 12 and a 10-year-old, and a four-year-old who's also uh, in a new school setting in pre-K for the first time. Uh, I, have, I was born in New York and lived here as a, as a little kid, but grew up outside of New York, and I came back to New York to go to college. Um, I attended Barnard College, and after that, I went to work for the Parks Department. And I spent two years working for the Parks Department um, and got to see really firsthand how uh, public policy and smart urban planning um, can really uh, work advantageously to protect our park space and to add, uh, you know, to the quality of life in our city, um, if done right. And of course, you want to do it right. So um, Randall's Island, when I started working there in um, 1993, <laughs> which was quite a while ago, um, didn't have nearly the number of amenities that it had now. And that public-private partnership between the, the Park Alliance and the public agency, the Parks Agency, um, grew and uh, continued to provide the kind of resources that you know, New Yorkers from everywhere can rely on. So when I think about that experience in terms of what it means for City Council District 1, you know, we have, we have some park space and some open space, not as much as maybe uh, the demands that we have with growing communities and growing families. Uh, we have a lot of shorelines and we need to have really smart, innovative ways, especially now that we have budgets that are gonna be um, strained to support our open space, to support our park space and to have continued smart uh, resiliency planning. Um, after working in the parks department, I went to law school when I was in law school, I was in a, a criminal defense clinic and I knew right away that criminal defense is what um, is the kind of law I wanted to practice. Um, when you are a public defender, you are often meeting your clients at a really low point in their life. Um, and you know, one of, the, one of the things I really love about my job is that you have an immediate ability to help people in a very tangible, real way to help people. Um, and it's my experience as a public defender that um, very much informs my uh, belief that the Bill de Blasio plan to spend $8.7 billion um, on building borough-based jails throughout our city is not a good idea. Uh, changing the zip code of failed policies doesn't fix the problems. And that money could be spent in such better and smarter ways to help truly disadvantaged New Yorkers. So um, happy to talk about that more too. I became a mom in 2006. And uh, as, as so many of us know, that's a full-time job. And I was lucky enough to be able to take time off from my job to be a full-time mom. Uh, and that's when I became more involved with my community. I joined community board two, uh, which I served on for five years. I have been elected as the president of community education council for district two. Uh, which is one of our largest school districts in the city with 49 schools and several pre-K centers. And I've also been elected to my kids' school leadership teams at PS41 in the Salk School of Science. Um, I've learned a lot from all of those roles, both about how large organizations work, about the interplays between agencies and community advocacy, um, just how to get things done, um, but also how to 
build bridges between communities that don't always want to engage in bridge building. <laughs> so um, there's been a you know, great benefit from all of those engagements. Um, I'd be happy to take some questions, but first I just do want to sort of acknowledge that I, I started this process of running for city council um, prior to COVID-19. And so we're all living in a very different world. Many, uh, we've had many New Yorkers who have died. We have many New Yorkers who are sick, many New Yorkers who are impacted with food insecurity, with housing insecurity. And so many of the things that we knew we need to work on prior to COVID, like creating more affordable housing and making sure that people have, um, you know, that we work on making sure that our communities can provide uh, good jobs and, and ways to stay safe and be in your home for seniors to be able to be uh, in their home. Uh, that's even more important now because of COVID-19. So I think New York has a big fight on its hands right now. Our neighborhood and all neighborhoods for, we've had a lot of people leaving, but we have so many more who are staying here. I have a little visitor, um, but we will, um, you know, I think together, <laughs> if we work together, we have a lot in our neighborhoods that we can continue to work on and can improve upon um, as we, <laughs> he'll, he won't be with me the whole time, but um, uh, what was I saying? What I'm saying is we live in a great city and our kids come into our room when we're having, when we're having conversations. I want to represent downtown New York and I know a lot, I've been in this neighborhood for a really long time and I'm, um, I'm thrilled to be here and talk to you all. So why don't you ask me some questions? <laughs> Thanks, Maud. Um, I see a couple of hands up, um, and I have a question too, but I'll hold mine. Uh, Marion, do you want to get us started? Um, sure. I actually have two questions. Sure. Uh, so one is, um, I'm, I was interested to hear your positions on the jail, and I wonder how that translates to your positions on the other kinds of upzone development that's been planned for our um, communities. Let's sure, well, that one. Then I have a second one if that's okay. Okay, sure. I mean, on the jail, I'm not in favor of building those new jails. I don't think it's our smart, mm -hmm. smartest use of money either for criminal justice reform initiatives, which are really sorely needed. Um, we've had some really good legislation passed recently, um, but in Albany, but I don't think it's the right way to prioritize the things that need to be done. Um, so I'm just not in favor of it. There are so many things wrong at Rikers Island. My big fear about spending that kind of money is that we don't fix the things that are wrong at Rikers Island. We just transfer them to somewhere else. Um, and, uh, you know, that has the two negative impacts of not fixing the problem and then not doing the things that we could do otherwise if we were spending that money more wisely. Um, as far as upzoning is concerned, I really think, especially our neighborhoods are so unique in Lower Manhattan from, you know, Tribeca to Battery Park City to the Lower East Side to Chinatown. Um, there's just so and many more smaller neighborhoods, but we have, um, I think we have to look at projects individually because um, there are some projects that I think are deeply problematic and that are not remotely community responsive. Um, and then your job as a council person is to oppose those and work with your community to oppose those um, projects. And then you have to look at the ones that, um, uh, that might have more, more value. I'm sorry, I'll forget the second question. I'm curious in what you think uh, about upzone developments provides more value for the community. What would well, be I some of those markers for you? Sure. I mean, I think if we want to build affordable housing, at some point we have to build affordable housing, but I think there's um, a way to do it so that it fits into the landscape of a community and that you, um, uh, you know, you can, you can control, uh, you can negotiate with developers, right? They don't have the right to come into a community and do whatever they want. You have, that's why you have legislators and that's why you have community organizations that can work together and that can insist the process be followed. Um, and that zoning regulations be followed. And when a community says, this is what we would be willing to, we want this much affordable housing, we want it to be in perpetuity, we want it to be, um, you know, uh, this many units for, and, and you start with a negotiating. And, and so if you up zone something, you do it as part of a negotiation so that a community is getting something that they want. Thank you. 
Do you mind if I just follow up with that actually? Do you, uh, uh, are you in favor of the uh, Soho NoHo rezoning plan that's been released? Um, not as I saw it being presented because it was sort of um, a, a, a take it or leave it for the whole, um, uh, for, for all the neighborhoods. I think, again, we're gonna talk about targeted spaces. I think there, um, the problem with saying we're gonna rezone this whole area is that the neighborhood loses control um, over what gets built. And so I think you can, I think it'd be much smarter in a neighborhood like Soho and NoHo to look at individual sites and, um, and try to, to try to go on a case by case basis. Uh, Bill, you got a question? Yeah, it's sort of a follow up to this. So uh, affordable housing is, is sort of tossed around uh, as a term. Uh, and like very few people are actually against it, but right. how it's implemented in New York is uh, the metrics are really important. So could you sort of talk to us about what you what would be the metrics you feel would make real affordable housing? Um, in terms of you know distributions, uh, uh, you know what 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 is considered affordable the uh, you know the income level of people what's what's considered affordable there uh, etc right well I mean I think there's a couple things with affordable housing because you're right when you say people talk about affordable housing very generally but there's um, there's two issues I guess that that come to mind with affordable housing one is how much we've been losing as house as units get decontrolled and de, you know rent uh, stabilization um, so you get houses that come out of the, you know, units that come out of those programs. And that's been in the last many years has been on steroids. Um, so you have this problem where you ha you're losing all of these units from programs that, that traditionally in New York have provided um, affordable housing for people and stable housing. And then at the same time, um, uh, you have uh, an administration that has been working, that has been through many different methods, right? Trying to um, work with developers to create more affordable housing. But if you're losing it faster than you're building it, um, you know, there's a net loss there. Um, it is true that there's sticker shock for plenty of New Yorkers for what is considered affordable housing, um, for what people are able to um, afford. And I do think it's, um, if you can, if you can have, if you can benchmark affordable housing to a neighborhood, and if you can benchmark what, um, you know, and it's really tough because we have neighborhoods with, um, with wide income variability, but I think you can, you can, you should certainly be able to talk about that income variability um, when you talk about what is really affordable so that people who are on the lower income end of a scale could actually afford the housing. Okay, uh, well, I guess though I was looking for a sort of more specific numbers, but let me ask another question related to this. I, I was actually looking at the campaign finance stuff and I actually, I saw that you get a fair amount of money from people in real estate, architecture and stuff like that, which are experienced in going to the community board and going to the city planning commission and dealing with the department of buildings is that, uh, Pretty universally, folks from that point of view uh, want more expensive housing, and they want bigger housing and taller housing and stuff like that. So uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the fact that you have don donations from uh, those people, and that uh, realistically, uh, it, it would affect your judgment on what is affordable. I have, my fundraising has come largely from folks that I know, um, from, uh, you know, when, when fundraising started, it started prior to COVID. So we were meeting in people's homes and in people's rooms. So it's friends and friends of friends. I have not solicited specifically from anyone, um, from real estate folks. So, um, you know, I haven't, I've, I've, I've taken money from individuals. I'm participating in the campaign finance program. And so I follow all of those guidelines. Um, so if there's someone who 
um, has worked in real estate in some way or the other. Um, they certainly didn't give me a donation um, <laughs> to, to talk to me about real estate because I haven't talked to anybody who's donated uh, to my campaign about real estate concerns. Um, I, we've talked about all of the general concerns uh, that we have as, as folks who live downtown. I mean, I've, I've also taken money from people who live in Brooklyn. I've got a sister who lives in Brooklyn. We have people from, from other places. So it's not every single person who lives downtown. But um, I'm surprised to hear you say that because that's not, um, you know, when I look over the list of people who have donated to me, that's not what, um, that's not what I see. Well, I saw Barbara Corcoran. Oh, <laughs> I play Scrabble with Barbara Corcoran. Okay, well, she hasn't, you know, she then, hasn't been you know, in uh, real estate and, for a and, long time. <laughs> and really several, several people who, I looked up their companies and their companies do real estate investment and uh, development stuff. Bill, like do you that. mind if we... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay, Go ahead. thanks. Hey, Brett, are you there? Do you want to ask this question? So yes, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Um, hi, Maud. Um, I'd be curious, hi there. I'd be curious to hear your ideas uh, for trying to attain greater school equity in the New York public schools, especially in our district, you know, District 1, where the wealth inequality is so great. Um, and, you know, uh, there's obviously such a disparity. But, you know, in our district, there's mostly unscreened schools that don't focus on testing and attendance as criteria, which I believe is, you know, quite a departure from your experience in District 2. So I'd love to, you know, get any uh, thoughts or ideas that you have on, you know, trying to agree, uh, achieve greater equity in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. So a uh, super great question, and I'm glad you asked it. Um, look, there is, um, there can be a really, uh, you know, really thoughtful, um, informed conversations around these issues. Um, and there can also be some contentious conversations around this issue. I have tried really hard to focus on listening to what folks have to say. And there, um, and in Lower Manhattan, there's, it includes school district one and school district two. So there's two different um, school districts, but there's really, you know, one community of Lower Manhattan folks who have a range of different schools, some screened, some unscreened, um, and some that, uh, you know, are doing are very well, that have been oversubscribed prior to COVID, and some that are struggling with undercapacity and struggling to retain uh, students. So there's a very significant range of schools in the district. Um, in terms of creating more equity, I think, I happen to believe strongly that it really helps to listen to what families are telling you is important to them and what they need and want in schools. Um, it's sort of a, if you build it, they will come uh, because families are very specific about what they want and what they're looking for in their kids' education. There are some families who very much don't want screen schools and want to have, um, uh, and they think that you will be able to achieve um, the sort of equitable and, and uh, integrated classrooms that they're looking for by getting rid of tests, by getting rid of gifted and talented programs and getting rid of those things. And there are other families that really want those programs and really think that accelerated curriculum is what um, will make their kids' education successful. And I think, given that <laughs> we have a million kids in the public school system, over 1,800 schools, um, that we really have the room to provide all of those kind of schools. A one size fits all at every moment is never gonna be the best option for New York City public school system, not even for a neighborhood like Lower Manhattan. So I think we can listen to what parents say they want, listen to what different communities say they want, and try to be responsive to that need. Thank you for that. I'm sorry, Ma, do you mind if I just follow up? Do you have a, sure. do you have a specific idea though of what that looks like? Uh, I mean, you're, it's, it's one thing to say that some families want this, some families want that, and we can, we can do both, but this school system has, has failed a, a large percentage of the children in the city. So I happen to think that um, you, can look at, you can look at two things, Jeremy, and you're right that it has failed a lot of kids. We have over 50% of kids who are not proficient on grade level reading or grade level math as measured by state tests. That's, an, that's a failure, um, a really disturbing failure. But we also have a lot of schools that are really, really successful and that have long wait lists and have, folk, have families trying to get into them, including some, some schools that have 
a great deal of ac economic success without a great deal of um, socioeconomic, you know, high status children, because a lot of people make an argument that there's, um, uh, that kids who have help maybe outside of the home can do better, uh, outside of the school rather from home. So I happen to think that what we should focus on is building the kind of school, like replicating the kind of schools that have been successful. And one of the ways to do that is to offer for all schools and in all communities, um, accelerated curriculum for kids who want it. Um, and I don't think the way we do it now is that smart, right? Gifted and talented programs like uh, that have kids testing in when they're four years old and then you're on a track and you don't go in or out, that doesn't work so well. You need um, a certain amount of flexibility so that kids can go in and out of programs that meet their levels and needs. So maybe you've always been, um, you know, a general ed reader, like a reader who's just on average uh, in your classroom, but you want an accelerated math program. We can do that in individual schools without designing screen programs, without designing gifted and talented programs. We can create a lot more flexibility in, school, in individual classes. Um, and another thing that I think we should focus on that has happened downtown um, with the construction of new schools is building K through eight schools because the screening process itself is not very family friendly. It's hard on kids, it's hard on families. And if we reduce the number of times that kids had to apply into schools, we could just spend more time um, teaching kids, right? Like fourth grade and fifth grade should be about learning and not about worrying about what school is coming down the corner. And because some of the new schools we've built have been K through eight, and some of the most popular schools that we have are six through 12 schools. And what those schools have in common is they take the burden of, of applying and screening off of families. And, um, you know, when you take that burden away, you can spend more time focusing on educating kids. Thanks. Uh, Keen, do you have a question for us? I can't hear you, Keen. Keen, I think you're muted. There we go. Uh, hi, Maud. Hi, how are you? Uh, good. Um, yes, of course, as you know, education's my issue too. Um, and so um, with this whole situation, I might agree we need great schools all over. That's a big concern and how to get it is not easy. But right now it looks like the Board of Education is not letting individual schools do what they want to do. Um, how, what would you, how should we deal with this COVID stuff? What do you, what do you, what would you see as the best way, you know, to do education right now? Um, look, that's a, you've just hit the nail on the head of one of the problems is not letting individual schools what they do what they want to do. I think it would be really great to give individual schools more freedom. In the COVID context, I'll give you an example. The, the DOE has said that um, schools have to choose a cohort model for their whole school. So you have to have three cohorts, say, even though if three out of the six of your grades could have two cohorts. So you could have kids in school so many more days, right? You could have kids in school two or three days a week in a two cohort model. And so we have schools in our district that are saying, why can't we have a two cohort model for pre-K through third grade or pre-K through second, we can give all those kids more in-person learning. Um, and that would be great, but they have too many kids in fifth grade to make that happen. So they want, so, but the DOE um, in its wisdom is saying that we have to have a one size fits all, the same number of models for everyone. Giving schools um, the freedom to experiment both with their curriculum and with their, uh, what, what kind of programming they wanna do and in the time of COVID with, with how they're gonna do blended learning is a really smart idea. And I think from that bubbles up different and good models that can be then shared in, in other contexts. Yeah, but how can, how can a city council person do that? Well, I've watched Mark Traeger use his city council um, you know, bully pulpit to try to affect change within the DOE. You can't um, you can't force it as a city council person. You're not in charge of the DOE, but you can have an influence over um, some of the policy. And I think, honestly, always the most effective way is to work in partnership with people and to gain trust and show that you're a good partner who is willing to support um, the organizations and the individuals that you're trying to work with. Thank you. 
All right, Maud, that's, uh, that's our 20 minutes, actually a minute over, I think, but um, uh, thank you so much. There's a lot more to say about this. Uh, there are some other questions in the chat. I'm sorry I can't get everybody uh, into this, um, but Maud, thanks very much for thank joining us. Thank you very us. much. Thank you all for listening. Uh, and we've got, uh, we've got our second candidate of the evening uh, with us tonight, uh, Christopher Marte. Uh, Chris, if you could also just uh, introduce yourself, let us know a little bit what your campaign's about, and then um, likewise, we'll, we'll get to some questions. Sounds good. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Christopher Marte. I'm running for City Council in District 1. For the past three years, I've worked for an organization called ARENA, where I help flip congressional seats from red to blue and help Democrats win a majority in the New York State Senate. I was born and raised on the Lower East Side, where my dad owned a bodega under my building. I attended the local public schools, studied abroad for college, spending two years in China, and then I started a career in finance. But as challenges arose in our community, like gentrification, small businesses closing, I realized that if I wanted to help the community, I had to work in it. And so I started doing just that, working on workers' rights, displacement, and creating community gardens in NYCHA. And, do, and through this work, I realized that many of our problems came from the same source. So in 2017, I ran for city council in a tight primary. I fell short by 200 votes, just 1% of turnout. But our message resonated with families from Soho, uh, restaurant workers from Chinatown, artists on the Lower East Side. We brought together neighbors who only lived a quarter mile away from each other, but never had a reason to work together before. And what we started in that campaign outlived election day and the coalition we were able to build achieved major victories. Within months of the primary, on a cold winter night, tenants at 85 Bowery came home from work to find out that they were being evicted. Their tenant association called me to figure out what was happening because many did not speak English. So I organized to support them. Members of this club, uh, Lee, Carol, Carol, oh, Carolyn, and Ian, and others stood with them during two hunger strikes. Tenants who get evicted in New York City never get to go back home. But after nine months and with the power of our community, they are finally able to return. Soon after that, the plans to build the four mega luxury towers and the two bridges started moving up. In our campaign, we actively tried pushing back against this. But now we had to figure out how to stop them without the support of our council member. We collected 5,000 signatures and delivered them to City Hall. And even though our elected officials continue to he ignore our voices, residents filed the lawsuit and won and stopped the construction. Again, when the mayor announced a mega jail in Chinatown, our council member said there was nothing she can do to stop it. I, I founded a local group called Neighbors United Below Canal to educate residents from Tribeca and Chinatown that this construction will hurt us and that how building new jails would not end mass incarceration. I led the largest march through Chinatown in over 50 years with thousands of new and old residents demanding no new jails. Just a few weeks ago, our lawsuit won and sent the city back to the drawing board. These campaigns were born of dire circumstances, but we won because of relentless hope. We proved that when people from all across this district come together, fight together, we can achieve something unimaginable. Look, the past six months have changed our community drastically. It can make the city council race look very small. But when you start looking at where COVID impacts us the most, it's right in our homes and it's right in our neighborhoods. And that's where a city council person can make the biggest difference. Our plan for recovery focuses on three main issues, land use, standard of living, and climate change. First, I will implement a community-based land use policy. Because of the virus, many New Yorkers are, are behind on rent. And now more than ever, we need to reclaim affordability of our neighborhoods and stop eviction through a comprehensive land use plan. My top priority is to pass the Chinatown Working Group Plan so we could create permanent and deeply affordable housing. Second, I'm running to improve our quality of life. As the city budget tightens, we cannot cut essential services like sanitation, education, and transportation. We must invest in expanding ACE, which hires homeless people to clean streets. We must provide free Wi-Fi and technology to all students. And we must expand busways and bike lanes 
to rethink how we commute. And third, we can't be stumbling from crisis to crisis. We must locally address climate change. If Hurricane Sandy were to hit again tomorrow, the only part of our shoreline that would be, that would be protected is Battery Park. I remember, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call remember, when Sandy hit, in some buildings, it went to the second floor. Nobody from Congress to council has stepped up to lead a resiliency plan that's, that's based on community input. I'm ready to fill in that leadership void. My team has already been doing the work that our council office should be doing. We deliver food to seniors in NYCHA and to the co-ops, partner with local small businesses to fundraise for PPEs for home attendance, connected women-owned businesses with local community banks to apply for the PPP loan, and I hosted free COVID testing sites on the Lower East Side to make sure that our immigrant communities get the services that they need. Tonight, I ask for your vote and your support because when we're alone, we start losing hope. But when we're together, we realize no one needs to give us power. We have it in our own hands. The next few years will be difficult, but if we're organized, united, and we have a plan for our district, we are already proven that there is nothing we cannot accomplish. Thank you for having me tonight. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, I see Kenny's got a hand up. Kenny? Yeah, hi. This, this question is actually for my mom, Judy Wynn. She couldn't be here tonight. She woke up with a fever. It's not COVID, they think. They think it's just a reaction to the flu shot. But she wanted to know, during this COVID times, what have you done for small businesses? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kenny. And I hope your, your mom is doing well and recovers quickly. Thank you. I'll let her know. <laughs> cool. Um, well, since the very beginning, uh, when COVID hit, we've been working with small businesses uh, to first apply for PPE loans and other grants that are out there, both private and public. Uh, more recently, in the past two months, we actually partnered with a law firm who's giving pro bono services uh, to make sure that people can renegotiate their leases with their landlords, but also um, apply for out, out, outside dining for small restaurants. And so they've been helping with translations, making sure that these small businesses don't get fines for not following the rules, because at one point the rules were changing almost on a daily basis. So my team has been extremely proactive, canvassing the neighborhood to make sure that they get the services uh, that they should get. Uh, Marion? Yeah, hi, Chris. Uh, um, first, I want to congratulate you. I know you got an endorsement from DID last night or yesterday or something. Um, so one of the things that has been very troubling and, um, you know, and, and a lot of the work we've been doing against a lot of upzoning and, and high development has been member deference in the city council. Yeah. So our current city council member doesn't seem to um, have, she, she seems to be unopposed to, mo to most development that goes on. Therefore, I have that, the lovely Extel building looking right outside my window. Um, and um, the, you know, Go Broom has gone through with every variance imaginable and has raised the, the uh, zoning from R8 to R9, which I'm sure will set a new standard for the neighborhood. So can you just talk about what, um, about member deference and about uh, if you were elected city council person, how would you manage that? Um, yeah, for, uh, for those of you who don't know, member deference is kind of like this unwritten rule in the council where if the council member votes one way on a land use decision that every other council member does. Uh, you know, I think for smaller, like one building issues, like it's hard for a council member to know what's happening in that district. However, for larger projects like Sunset, which has happened in Sunset Park or what's being proposed in Flushing, I think you have to be independent and work with community organizers on the ground to know how it's going to impact our community. Um, for example, you know, there's a major rezoning that was announced today for Soho and NoHo. However, no one's talking about the displacement of an upzoning is going to cause in this neighborhood. Um, and so I think we need an active council member that's going to look at these major rezonings and work with activists on the ground. Uh, many of them who I've been 
built amazing relationships with because of the land use fights we had on our district, whether it was the jail or the two bridges site. Uh, but I think you need a council member that's going to be independent, especially um, these huge rezonings, because we all know they don't, they don't live in a vacuum. Uh, these major rezonings affect neighborhoods all around them and the city as a whole. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Keen? There. Um, so I've been going in the beginning, every night at seven, I would yell out my windows, good hooray and stuff, and then I stopped. And I'm thinking about essential workers. Um, it's complicated, but especially with sanitation, are they essential workers? And what is your plan for them or, or other essential worker kind of issues? Yeah, I, I believe they are. Um, however, you know, with the latest budget, there was major cuts when it came to sanitation. Um, but there are ways where we could fill in that void and that we have to fill in that void. Um, one of the biggest fears in people when they see um, trash on their sidewalks, they feel like their city is, is failing them. And right now it's apparent that in some cases they are. And so I think we have to use, you know, outside organizations, like I mentioned ACE, which hires homeless people to clean our streets. Um, there's other programs that we can uh, implement in our communities that are more green friendly. Um, I think we should have the compost pilot program in any building that wants to buy into it. Um, so we're moving towards a greener planet and a greener community. Uh, but, you know, I think sanitation workers are essential workers. Home attendants are essential workers. Um, and, you know, I've been respecting all the work they've been able to do. Thank you. Hey, Chris, I wanted to uh, follow up with you about something. So you talked about, um, uh, you talked about Chinatown Working Group. Yeah. And the Soho Noho rezoning um, that came out today. One question is, what what do you what do you see as the fundamental difference between those two plans? Yeah. So the Chinatown Working Group creates deeply affordable permanent housing, um, and so that's the biggest difference between the Soho and Noho rezoning. Um, right now, um, there's only three sites where they actually can build new residential locations in Soho and Noho. And they can build as of right. So if we wanted to build affordable housing, we could probably build more affordable housing pre-upzoning than upzone. What upzoning allows in this area is that it's going to cause displacement in neighborhoods around it. Um, and the, also, Chinatown Working Group is community-led. Over 80 organizations came in, people who have been fighting displacement, who have been fighting gentrification. They created the plan. Uh, this plan for Soho and Noho was driven by real estate interests um, who, who have investment in the areas where you can develop. And so I think what we've seen from this mayoral administration is that they have always taken the developer plan to rezone a neighborhood and completely ignore a community-driven plan like the Chinatown Working Group. Thanks. Uh, Naomi, you've got a question you posted in the chat. Do you want to hop in and ask Chris? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hey, no, you're Perfect. Me. Hey, Chris. Um, so <laughs> as you are aware, for years, um, Margaret Chin has never engaged in discretionary funding projects until last year, even though when it's majority, over half of the council was doing this in their local districts. Um, will you commit to continue to do such practice? Um, because I find that in other districts, it really brings in community and even children who are allowed to vote to really have some say in, in, in funding what's important to us. Yeah, I truly believe in participatory budgeting. I think that's what you're, you're referring to. Um, in 2017, this is one of, the, one of my pillars of the campaign, allowing for people in our community to have a say in government and where your taxpayer dollars go whether it's capital projects in NYCHA, building new water fountain, repairing playgrounds. Um, we should have a budgeting process that's equitable, that's transparent, um, and that actually serves the community. So I, I want to commit to at least giving a million dollars of my budget, city council budget, to be part of the participatory budgeting process. Uh, Bill? Hey, Chris. 
so I was going to ask you, uh, since you've already answered most of the questions I usually have about rezoning and housing, is uh, another issue that's big in our neighborhood is the issue of uh, transportation and road stuff, uh, you know, traffic, transportation, things like that. What's your take on it? Uh, that, that might be a little bit uh, of a microcosm in terms of maybe we have problems that other people have, but this district does have a bunch of arteries that go to other places outside of Manhattan, to Brooklyn. So uh, I just wanted to hear your take on that. Yeah, right now we, we don't have a plan when it comes to transportation or traffic. Uh, one good example is um, Clinton and Grand Street, right? There's the Go Broom project that's coming on board fa fairly soon. There's the buildings at Grand Street Guild that's coming on soon. And plus there's the completion of Exit Street Crossing that's gonna finish but still be in process while the other two get started. We're gonna have a traffic nightmare on Clinton and Grand. And right now agencies in our council office aren't working together to find a remedy. Um, and this is the, one of the main arteries that actually goes to the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, I think we need a council person that understands what construction is going to happen in a multi in a multi year timeline and start planning early around it to make sure that we don't have the noise pollution, we don't have the contamination, and we don't have the risk to safety to our seniors and our kids. Um, so right now, I think we're definitely failing our community. We need someone that has a long term plan. Thanks. I'm you. Hey, Tommy, you got a question? Uh, um, Chris, the community boards have become almost futile in, in the process. Um, number one, there seems to be no real clout to their decisions, either with the city or the local elected officials, regardless of what they do. And it's become somewhat of a mutual aid society. It's filled with a lot of people sometimes who have vested interest in the community. And um, it, it seems to be less independent and representative of the community than perhaps it should be. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas of how you use your community board appointments uh, should you be elected. Yeah, I think on a, on a community board on a, on a bigger scale, I think we need a city charter revision to actually allow community boards to have a vote at city planning. So the community has some stake in the game. Um, on a more local level, um, I think for me, for when it comes to appointment, I'm planning not to appoint people who have real estate interests because we've seen how a lot of these decisions favor real estate developers or people who work for the real estate industry. Um, I also believe we need our community boards to be so much more equitable and actually representative of the community. And this is where a council person could help with recruitment and use our office as an organizing office to educate people the importance of a community board and make sure that we have a community board that looks like us. Um, not only community board three, but community board two and community board one. Uh, can Carolyn, I in, do you have a yeah. question? Yeah, uh, so Chris, in addition to some of the work you've been doing that you described, get helping businesses get the, uh, PPP loans and everything. What do you see a year or two from now? Uh, how can you, at, at the city council level, support small businesses? And I'm talking specifically about Orchard Street right now, which lost, you know, dance academies and coffee shops, old and new coffee shops, and, you know, so many things that used to be really wonderful for the neighborhood and before COVID already was just kind of a canyon of empty storefronts. Yeah, um, I believe even before COVID, we needed commercial rent control. Uh, one of the biggest problems for small businesses throughout our district is when they renegotiate their lease, sometimes their landlords could spike it 500% with, with no accountability, no transparency. Um, I also believe that we have to reform our small business services agency. This is the agency in, in city government that's meant to serve small businesses make sure that they apply for PPP loans, apply to other grants to survive. Um, you know, in November, we might have, hopefully we'll have a president that's willing to give us funds so we can bail out all our small businesses. Small businesses in New York City uh, employ 80% of the population. 
So this is truly important. One thing we could do as a council member, even though we don't have the, we're, we don't, we're not um, on the federal side, is making sure that small businesses are ready to apply. Small businesses, whether they speak uh, Cantonese, Fujianese, Spanish, uh, that they know what they need to do to be the first to get the funds so then they can stay open. And I'm committed to doing that. I've been doing that work throughout this pandemic and hopefully I can continue it as your next city council member. Okay, thanks, Chris. I think that's uh, the end of our 20 minutes, but thanks for joining us. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. And uh, we move on to our third candidate for the evening, uh, Denny Salas, um, who I believe is here, but I don't see his picture. Denny, are you here? I am here. Can oh, you hear there me? You go. Yep. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Okay. I'm well. How are you doing? Uh, good, good. Uh, so good. same thing for you if you want to take a couple minutes to introduce yourself and let us uh, know about your campaign and then um, and then we'll open up for questions. Absolutely. So first, I just want to thank everybody for having me. Um, this is going to be an interesting election. I think 2021 is obviously going to be uh, one of the most consequential elections here for the city. Um, we're facing a number of issues. And I believe that our city is actually reckoning with kind of the unequal and some of the racist past that we need to dismantle. So that, you know, have held New Yorkers are colored back for generations. And we're also dealing with a housing crisis where we know from the partnership for New York City, who just recently did a study where we need to build 760,000 new affordable units. And then we have to keep pace so we know that our fellow citizens have a roof over their heads. Additionally, we're on the precipice of economic calamity. Not seen since the Great Depression. Nearly half of all businesses have closed in Manhattan, leading to over 500,000 job losses. And all these problems, problems can seem daunting, but I'm running to solve them. And what we need is elected officials that are not shying away from these challenges, but embracing them. And we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> My ideas to solve these problems are more ambitious than the rest of the field, and we can do it with the determined leadership that I'm offering. So what is it that I'm going to do? Well, first, we have never confronted the prejudice systems that have long permeated in everyday New York life. I will hold police accountable by passing legislation that requires them to carry liability insurance so our taxpayers no longer have to foot the bill for their malfeasance. I will punish precincts when they try to retaliate against our citizens by taking longer to respond to emergency and non-emergency calls. And I will also eliminate the use of tear gas that's banned from international warfare, but yet we use it on our citizens today. One thing that I also realized is that being a cop is a very hard job. My father-in-law served in the Air Force after college and then continued his call to service by becoming a police officer for nearly 30 years. I respect their call to duty. And I realize that being a cop has a mental toll on our officers. They're continuously exposed to high stress situations and at times, some of the most painful crime scenes dealing with kidnappings, rapes, and murders. Those instances weigh on them and can lead to a calamitous ending. NYPD officers have the highest suicide rate than any other subgroup within our population. And to do our part, we must invest in mental health services so our officers are not burdened by their everyday job. The last thing we want to continue to happen is when a difficult situation arises and past trauma has not been dealt with, that it leads an officer to react poorly that can lead to a deadly end. Additionally, we gotta fix our schools. We have to have our educational system ensure better outcomes. And one thing I will do is create new partnerships between our best performing schools in our lowest performance schools, so all of our students are no longer left behind. I will also revamp our specialized high school entrance exam by automatically enrolling the top 5% of every middle schooler to these wonderful schools. But I'm not gonna eliminate the test. Instead, I will revamp it by having students who fall within the top six to 25% take the exam to gain admissions to to the specialized high schools, and I wouldn't stop there as well. I will add a performance-based assessment a far more accurate measure of students' knowledge to provide options for those who want to attend some of our finest high schools in New York City. I have always said that education is the number one anti-poverty program our country has ever created. 
and it's a long past time for our city to ensure every child gets an access to an excellent ed education here. Moreover, we need, to, we need to end exclusionary zoning practices that have long held working and middle-class New Yorkers from living and owning their own homes in high opportunity areas around the city. I will encourage new construction that not only puts people back to work, but also builds affordable homes and decreases the pressure of rising rents and puts a halt to gentrification. I will pass bills to build a new Mitchell Llama where middle-class New Yorkers are no longer forced to move outside the city they love simply because they want to start a family. To many, to too many current New Yorkers have benefited from an old program like that, and it's time for a new generation to have the same opportunities that have often been yanked away from them due to selfishness. And finally, we must improve our economic outlook by supporting our small businesses. I will create super blocks, removing cars off our streets and creating open space and the environment for increased foot traffic where our businesses will succeed. One thing that we need to do is also provide wage subsidies to not only keep people employed, but to encourage new hiring. Our businesses for far too long have also been saddled with the high cost of operation, and we must do what we can to remove burdensome regulations and red tape that leads them to needlessly spend tens of thousands of dollars to keep operating. Our businesses need to blossom, and it's incumbent on us to create the environment for them to do so and help them put New Yorkers back to work. Sorry, excuse me. Our city is also facing, is facing simultaneous challenges that no one could have predicted entering 2020. The loss of over 25,000 city residents, including over 4,200 children who no longer have a parent at home, has exposed these dilemmas that have long been kicked down the road for other people to tackle. I'm here running, and I'm here to say that the time, the time to solve these problems are now. We cannot wait any longer. We all have responsibility to each other, and I believe that the wind is at our backs, pushing us to deliver on these long delayed promises. I'm often reminded of a quote from John F. Kennedy when he said, our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man, and man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing that's holding us back from solving our problems is ourselves. We're capable of tackling these issues. And I promise, as your next city council member, that my resolve and will will not falter. Our city deserves that, and I intend to deliver. Now, those are some of my policy priorities. And I encourage you to visit my website to see some of the rest at dennysalis.com. And I want to thank everybody for having me. So let's open it up, take some questions. <laughs> Thanks, Denny. Uh, Carolyn, you put a question in the chat. Do you want to start us off? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I have two kids, a middle schooler and a high schooler, and so we're on our third, ex our experience with our third public school now. And you mentioned partnerships between schools. And so I want to know what your, what engagement have you had so far with New York City public schools that informs that? And what specifically does that mean? Like, it, like, what's one concrete example of that partnership? Absolutely. So I work for a school right now. I work for a charter school located up in the Bronx. And the very first grant that I co-wrote was a three-year $500,000 dissemination grant that was issued by New York City Education Department. And what we did is we partnered up with the two local uh, public schools located in the immediate area, PS 111 and PS 112. And then what we did is partner with their mathematics department and actually improved their mathematics scores, knowing that ours were actually through the roof and our assessments through the roof. And, you know, I'll just, before I continue answering the question, but just to brag a little bit about the school that I work for, um, it's about a thousand students, nearly 80% live below the poverty line, 100% of them are black and brown. And what we in our outcomes actually rate with the top 11% of the wealthiest school districts. So when you look at our assessment scores, especially for ELA and mathematics, they're absolutely through the roof. So what we wanted to do is partner with the neighborhood community because we're a community-based school. And what we're able to do is work with the mathematics teachers for both PS 111 and PS 112 and actually improve their mathematics outcomes throughout the course of that dissemination grant. So that is one example. Um, 
I'm so, sorry, but I just, I don't understand what that means specifically. I understand that you got a grant, but like, what does that mean? Like what, what happened? What, you know? Oh, so what, so our teachers, our mathematics teachers and our professional development staff went in there and actually trained the mathematics teachers for PS for public schools, so PS 111 and PS 112. We sat in their class, observed them, see exactly what may, what hasn't been working, what has been working based on some of the, the kind of the pedagogy that we do in our own uh, particular school. And then we train them based off that. And then they started implementing that type of, that type of process and educational curriculum um, to their students within that school. So I, I see a follow up in the chat that seems related to this, which is, you know, you, charter schools are not public schools. So what's your I feeling disagree. about- I disagree, I would well, disagree. So charter the question schools in the chat schools. is, what's yeah. your feeling <laughs> about public schools? I love public schools. My wife is a former public school teacher. Um, she was a Title I school teacher down in Florida before we moved, moved to New York. And I am a public school child myself. But and I'll tell you a story, and maybe anecdotal, but it's also true and it's factual about also attending schools in a higher opportunity area. When I was growing up, I didn't, you know, I'm first generation in this country, and my parents from the Dominican public, and we grew up poor. We didn't grow up with anything. And when my siblings and I started attending school, we were living in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Now, if anybody knows Lawrence, they know it's not necessarily the best. But also, if you're an Elizabeth Warren fan, that's also where she made her campaign announcer for president, just so you know. <laughs> um, but when we started attending school there, my parents said this to us. They're like, you know what? We know that in order to make it in this country, you actually have to have a great education. So what they did and said is that they sent us to the neighboring town of Methuen, Massachusetts, which was a much better school system. But in order for us to attend, we had to lie about our address. My parents told us that in order to go here, we have to lie. And that's illegal. And no parent should ever have to go to these extraneous circumstances in order to make sure that child gets a great education. So the way that I look at it is that all schools, I don't care whether they're public charter school, traditional public school, or even private schools. The one thing we can be doing is harnessing all the talent that we have and all the best performing schools, and it doesn't matter whether the primary or secondary level, in creating these partnerships, tearing down these old walls and battles, and making sure that we can have the best educational outcomes for our students. Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. And I'll tell you, we benefit. My family and I, because of the sacrifice my parents had to make, and because they started doing well, I'll tell you, you know, we ended up doing much better because my dad ended up getting his GED, then going to college. And then basically we successfully kind of lived the American dream. My older sister, William Fulbright scholar, PhD in psychology. My older brother, um, funny story, I'll tell you, but he goes to college for one semester, drops out, and he drops out and tells my parents and then says, it gets a 4.0 by the way, and drops out and then says, I'm smarter than my professors. And what he's doing now, he's actually a long haul truck driver. So he's an essential worker that's been going all across the country delivering all these goods and services. Then myself, I'm here, and my younger sister just finished her master's in economics and now she's working towards her PhD. And I know for a fact that none of that could have been possible if my parents didn't do everything possible to make sure that we get, we got a great education. And when I look at what we can do by partnering schools, it doesn't really matter if they're a charter school, whether a traditional public school or even private school, if they're delivering for their students and we can create these partnerships to improve some of the lowest performance schools in the city, then, I, then I'm for that. And that's something that I'm advocating for because I've seen it done. I've worked on it and I can see that that's a possibility for the rest of the city. So would you seek to increase charter schools in uh, City Council District 1? Not necessarily. I, what I want to do is I actually want to improve existing public schools that we currently have, especially some of the lowest performing ones. I don't want to see any more children being lost to a system that's not delivering on a basic promise. And I'm, and it, it makes me angry every single year when I see educational outcomes not living up to the standards of what we need to be doing for our kids. And I believe it starts in the classroom. I believe that we can do it in the school and also school environment. But I also think that we need to kind of think differently and think creatively in order to solve a lot of these issues. Education for me, I'll tell you right now, is one of my biggest issue. It's my top issue. I love education. I know how important it is. And I really want to see every single child in New York City succeed. 
Uh, okay, I think we need to move on because we're running out of time. Uh, hey, Marion, do you want to jump uh, in? Actually, Naomi asked the question I was going to ask. I wonder if she'd rather ask it. Uh, sure, Naomi. Um, thanks. So, Denny, um, I'm kind of interested in like what brought you to um, City Council District 1 because um, a lot of us on this call sort of know each other because we're super committed in our communities, we're on the ground, we're doing the work, um, but I, many of us don't know you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I would love to hear like what got you here, why you wanna do this, and what work have you done in the community that I may not know about? That's a good question. So, oh, she doesn't have a face. Sorry. All right, so I know someone just said something, sorry. Um, so this is what I'll say. When I first, I've an individual, I moved to New York about five years ago and I've lived in the same apartment here in district one since then, my wife and I. Um, and I've been all over the country. I've traveled to 42 states around this country, um, some multiple times. I grew up in New England. I lived in DC for five and a half years. I lived in Florida for a year. And the only place that I've ever been to that felt like home is here in the city. And I know for a fact, if you heard that yelp, that's one of my dogs, I apologize. <laughs> um, but uh, sorry. And I know for a fact that my wife and I, we wanna raise our kids here. We wanna make sure that our kids have access to the best schools and we wanna send them to public schools and we wanna stay here for the rest of our lives. Now, I love the question that it says like, all right, well, where have you been? And for me, I smile and chuckle at it because it's similar to, and it's akin to um, that question of like, you know, if a fall, if a tree falls in the woods, it doesn't make a sound, you know? It's like similar to that. And for me, it's been this. I have worked in the Bronx, I mean, I've lived here, but I've worked in the Bronx community. And that's a community there, like just mentioned. In this school system, over 80% live below the poverty line. Over two to 5% of that school community on an annual basis are, are deemed home insecure. Not only have I raised nearly one and a half million dollars for this particular school, but what I've additionally done is I've created a financial literacy program for parents. I created the school's first ever music band. I created a, a robotics program, an engineering program, a coding program. I've supported a number of extended learning programs and Saturday learning programs. I've done all these things because I knew working for this community that I'm gonna have an immediate impact by my efforts and my ability to actually make a difference. Now, that's where my focus has been because it has been in a community of great need. Now, me running for this seat and I'll let you know, the catalyst for me running was the George Floyd murder. And obviously by looking at me, you know I'm a person of color. Obviously I, I've been exposed to racist incidents throughout my professional and my personal life. But additionally, I've always known all the structural racism, all the old policies, all the stuff that has led to generations of inequities within not only the city, but just across the country. And when I, was looking at who's running and I was looking at what the policies are proposing, I was disappointed, I'll be honest. I know that through my, my experience in my own professional life where I've done grassroots organizing for President Obama's um, political organization, Organizer for America. I have worked on Capitol Hill where I got to do research for the Affordable Care Act. I was a consultant, political consultant for Democratic members of the House and Senate. And I also was a lobbyist for small businesses, small business manufacturing, traveling, you mentioned earlier, or traveling all across the country. And then I worked in education here in the city in one of the most poorest zip codes in the city up in the Bronx. So all my experiences basically led me with the catalyst of what occurred with George Floyd, basically just said, you know what? I believe that I can add something to this race and I believe that I can make a difference. So I took that and I ran with it. And I said, you know what? I'm jumping in this race. You may have not heard of me, but you're hearing of me now. And you know what I've done, and I, and I know that I can make a difference in this race. So that's why I'm in it. Can I follow Thanks. up on that? Or can we, are we out of time? Uh, we, we've got like 30 seconds if you wanna hop in there with one more thing, sure. Uh, yeah, just uh, 
to follow up on specifically city council district one, if you can talk about what, you know, some very local issues that you have been involved in, in our community. So the other than just volunteering at like God's love we deliver or other things like that, that's really what my wife and I have been donating money that we do stuff like that for local communities, especially uh, for the Bowery mission uh, the coalition for homeless is one of my favorite charities as well. Um, but I would say this other than money and given time, the other issues is actually just listening to what the concerns are now and running for this race. One of the things that I've done and I've reached out to are a number of small businesses here in the city and in our districts, particularly in our district, where I've had numerous conversations and actually hearing them out and listening exactly what their main concerns are. And one of the things that they gravitate towards me and my candidacy has been the idea of super blocks, where we are, where my, what I'm calling for is just removing streets or moving cars off the streets completely where it's has been relegating them to the major thoroughways. So then we can see the positive effects that we've seen when they were implemented down in Barcelona in 2016, where super blocks have led to basically three really main, I guess, benefits. One, increased foot activity, where small businesses not only been able to increase their economic output, but also been able to hire local people um, because they've been experiencing this boom in businesses. Another thing we've been seeing is community health benefits where people are going outside, actually meeting their neighbors and actually hanging out within the community. And then three, also just the pure health effect where they're not sucking up car fumes anymore. Now, when I talk to small businesses, especially what they care about, super blocks has been one thing that I know them and very, they've been gravitating towards and also receptive towards, but also my idea of wave subsidies and also additionally to actually limit the expense of what they spend on insurance costs and also lessening costs on rent regulations. So if you're asking about what I've done specifically in the community, you know what, I'm running now and I'm gonna make a difference. So my past has been working up in the Bronx and that's literally where I've dedicated almost all my time because of the great need that's been needed in that community. But I'll tell you right now, I do live in this, in this district and I'm gonna make a difference now. Okay, thanks a lot, Denny. Uh, that's yeah. all the time we've got this evening, but uh, really glad you could join us. Uh, and Chris, thanks again. Maud, thank you for coming by. Um, for everybody uh, who's joining us this evening who hasn't before, thank you so much for stopping by. Please go to grandstreetdems.nyc and join the club. Uh, we, uh, we do this a lot and we'd love to see you back. So have a great night, everybody. Thanks very much. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.